Good morning. A full house today. This is wonderful. Welcome. We're so happy to have you all here. I'm Kit Leggett, and I'm part of the social studies team here at ASP, and we're very happy to bring you today's session with Dr. Fred Johnson. Now I'm going to ask you to take out your cell phones, and ensure they're, <laughs> ensure they're silenced. So we're not going to be distracting from today's presentation. Also, welcome to the crowd who's joining us via Zoom in the Haas Virtual Classroom. And our special thanks to Gloria Goodwin for supporting our hybrid modality this morning. Are you interested in helping Haas become more environmentally friendly? If so, you're invited to join other like-minded Haas members for an introductory exploratory session in the Haas classroom this afternoon at three o'clock. As another reminder, we will, we will welcome Holocaust survivor Tova Friedman to her monthly program one week from today. Uh, excuse me, that would be one week from yesterday, Tuesday the 10th at the Jack Miller Center for Musical Arts. There will be coffee, cookies, and conversation beginning at 9 a.m. Students, faculty, and staff in the community are welcome to attend. Tova will be available following the program to greet you and sign copies of her memoir, The Daughter of Auschwitz. You can purchase your own from the Hope College Bookstore, Reader's World, or from the Haas office, where we have a limited number of copies, and they'll be available after class today. The day before that, it will be next Monday, the 9th at 3 p.m. You can be introduced to Tova's story when we will be screening the documentary Surviving Auschwitz, written by Haas member Milt Nusma. This <clears throat> free screening at the NIC will be followed by a panel featuring this film's director, writer, and producers. And we hope you can join for both incredible events. This morning, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Fred Johnson. We have some social sciences is very proud to uh, host our courses called Great Decisions. And this morning, our course is uh, called China and the United States. In recent years, the United States and China have been locked in a struggle for, struggle for global economic, political, and military supremacy. One major point of contention is the question of Taiwanese sovereignty. This longstanding issue has become more immediate given China's crackdown in Hong Kong and Russia's invasions of the Ukraine. And they may encourage China to take action regarding Taiwan. How will the United States engage a China that is increasingly seeking to expand its sphere of influence? That's what we'll talk about today. Dr. Johnson, as you know, has been a professor of history at Oak College for 23 years. He uh, holds the Guy Vanderjack Endowed Chair for History at Oak College. He has degrees, uh, master's and doctorate from Kent State. He is a Marine Corps veteran and his primary field of study is mid 19th century US history, specifically the Civil War and his other areas of expertise are 19th century U.S. history, excuse me, 20th century U.S. history, U.S. military history, and African history. And I invite you to join me in welcoming this morning our presenter, Dr. Fred Johnson. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, scholars of Haas. I was talking with Ian. He said, this is going to be my last time with you this semester. And I said, well, that's pretty sad. That means this is the last time that I have people showing up as you want to see me. <laughs> he said that my specialty is 19th century U.S. history, specifically the Civil War. And people always ask me, well, why are you talking about all this other stuff? 
you know, China, foreign policy, short attention span, what can I tell you? <laughs> well, like Kit pointed out, China's influence over the last few years has been growing. So let me give you, let me start off with a, with a few anecdotes, just, just a couple of stories. In 2019, I was uh, I went to a global health conference in uh, in Ecuador. We we landed in Quito, and I spent three days. Went down the Tipitini River, which is one of the tributaries of the Amazon, into the in, into the Amazonian rainforest. And that global health conference was, believe it or not, one of the issues that we discussed in that week was what should, what should countries do in the event of a global pandemic. That was part one. Part two was in Hong Kong that year in December. We went to flew to Hong Kong and discussed again, what should you do in the event of a global pandemic? Now, Hong Kong is about 500 miles from the Wuhan district where they say that the pandemic broke out, you know, the meat market or whatever they call it. But while there, I, we, we were not, we're not in a lot of places in Hong Kong and Hong Kong at the time was still trying to fight the encroachment by the Chinese government on the mainland. Now, so I went, I went through a tunnel, trying to cross the street, went through an underground tunnel, and saw graffiti on the walls in the tunnel that were protesting against the main government on the mainland. Now, obviously, the people that wrote that graffiti, they had been caught some pretty dire consequences for them. And quite frankly, I even had second thoughts about taking pictures of this on my, on my cell phone, but I said, this is just too good to not show my students back in Michigan, so, or at whole College. So I took some pictures, they show down with communism, down with the mainland, down, you know, down with this, down with that. So people are protesting in Hong Kong. And I also had a friend of mine who actually, she opened up, she's living in Finland, but she, she had a school that she'd opened up for church. She's real big in her early primary, early primary education. She'd been running the school for about maybe, I don't know, nine, 10 years. When one day she said the Chinese government just came in, just took her school and everything. She'd been there building that school for a decade and she was getting real results. Of course, they had American children there, but they were, you know, multilingual, the American le children learning Chinese, Chinese children learning, learning, learning English. Then all of a sudden, the government just came in and said, this is a successful enterprise, and it's ours. She protested against it. There was nothing to do because the Chinese government said, you're here in our country doing business. You're here because we let you. So, you know, when we decide that, you, you understand that you're here because as long as we let you, and when we decide you're too much of an inconvenience, you're out. She was out that kept all her intellectual property and everything that she had built though. So we are dealing with an entity that is been around for a long time, obviously, but not nuanced when it comes to exerting their policy. I wanna spend a few moments looking at this video from The Great Decisions, just a very few moments, because I wanna make sure we get to some other stuff. I looked at this last night, this has some things that you know, I'm gonna be talking about, but then there are some other things that are more and more relevant to me, what's happening right now, particularly in light of what happened yesterday in Washington, which has some immediate applications, long-term relative to not just global policy, but America's domestic policy, but also national security. And I'm telling you, every time I ever, the, <laughs> sometimes I remember this record that I, that I, harassed my mother to buy me when I was a kid. It was C produced by CBS Records, and the intro was, was Walter Cronkite. Remember the most trusted man in America? Walter Cronkite came, came on, you know, all the dramatic music in the background, and he said, during the 1930s, Europe hungered for peace, but fascism, gorging, gorging itself on the weaknesses of faltering democracies, pushed onward toward war. I think about that a lot these days. During the 1930s, the world, was somehow struck with a disease. During the 1930s, Europe hungered for peace because of World War I. But fascism, which amazingly enough in the 1930s, people seemed to want it. They wanted it in Spain because they got it with Franco. They wanted it in Portugal. They got it there. They wanted it in Italy because they got Mussolini. Then they wanted it in Nazi Germany. So from this standpoint, you might ask yourself the question, why would anybody want that given the record of it? Why would anybody want that now? Okay, back then, maybe you didn't know what was going to happen. Well, why would you want it now, given the incontrovertible evidence of what that produces? Why would anyone want authoritarian government? We understand that democracy has its problems, but why would you want that as an alternative?
Europe hunger for peace. But faltering democracies failed, so they pushed onward toward war. With no opposition, with nothing to stop them, they produced the obvious outcome, which, which is what they wanted. At least in Hitler's case, in Mein Kampf, he said, yeah, warfare is what I want. Persecution of the Jews, global annihilation, this is what I want. Some men, to borrow those lines from the Batman movie, some men just want to see the world on fire. That is their goal. I like to recommend that we get buckets and full of water and put the fire out. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Great Decisions 2023, an eight-lecture masterclass brought to you by the Foreign Policy Association. We continue to work through our Great Decisions challenges here in week number three. Our focus is on China and its relationship to the United States. When we think about the foreign policy of any nation in the world, there are three core elements that go into that foreign policy calculation. On the one hand, there are the capabilities of the country. What can it achieve? What is it capable of obtaining in the world around it? Next, we have the interest of the country. It's quite possible that interest and capabilities do not align. Sometimes nations have a much greater capability than they have interest, and at other times, their interests outstrip their capabilities to accomplish them. And then finally, we look at the leadership of the country, its competence, its ability. Beginning with capabilities. As we think about China, there are three elements of capability. The first is population, which has always been very large, and it has grown significantly over the course of the 20th and now into the 21st century. Economically, the Chinese began to catch up with the rest of the world in the 1980s and have continued to do so into the 21st century. And then finally, militarily, all of that investment in the post Mao Zedong era has paid off for China. Its military is increasingly modern, diversified, and far reaching in its capabilities. So we think about capabilities in China and they're clearly on the upside. Next comes interest. What does China want and what has China always wanted? If we go back to the founding of the People's Republic of China in 1949 and consistently since then, a core interest of the country is the survival of the Chinese Communist Party, the party of Mao, the party of Xi. This may seem like an obvious observation, but in the United States, it's not a core interest to keep Democrats or Republicans in power, nor in Canada, in France, or any other democracy. Our core interests are in the peaceful and managed transition of power among political parties. But for China, it's authoritarian, it's all about one party rule and the centrality of the Communist Party. Beyond that, early on, China wanted to consolidate its control over internal territories. It considers internal to be Tibet, the Western regions where the Uyghur live, and even Taiwan. So internals in quotation marks because not all of the world acknowledges that those territories are really part of China. Recognition of Red China as the sole and legitimate representative of the Chinese people was next, followed by great power status, and then possibly leadership in the international system. There's much talk of China aiming to be the dominant power in the world, surpassing the United States in both power and authority. Okay, let me make this real simple for us. We should not let that happen. Okay, there are, there are surveys taken annually every now and then that ask people around the world, you know, where would you, what, if you had a choice of a leading countries in the world to be the dominant power, superpower, and it includes the United States, Russia, China, and maybe some other ones here and there. Which one do you choose? Well, generally speaking, the result has always been the last few years that, yeah, the United States has a lot of problems, obviously. A nation of 300 plus million people is going to have some issues and challenges. 
But two, usually the conclusion is that given a choice of those three, America is the better choice. And by the way, that whole thing about managed peaceful transfer of power, we got to go back and interrogate that one. China is looking for a number of things that their video said in the intro about great power status, whether or not it will be a leading nation, recognition, survival, uh, expanding military. All those things have are not just symptoms of a current state of affairs, but China is a nation that existed for thousands of years. We have been around since for 247 years. That is a drop of water on a very hot day on the windscreen of history. China for the last few years has been expanding from east to west, whereas the United States, because of its position, we've always been a Pacific power ever since 18, 1850, at the conclusion of the Mexican-American War, when California came into, the, came, came into the Union as a free state. The mere fact that California exists on the western coast of the United States means that we had, a, had at least an outlet, a window to the Pacific Ocean, and that window expanded eventually. So just like in the 1930s when America was expanding further, so I say even with the Spanish-American War, when America was expanding east as, as Japan at the time was expanding west, there was a there was a geographic collusion that was about to happen, which would no which not a, which would not have been a problem if Japan had not become more aggressive in the 1930s. But we were rather aggressive ourselves. So let me tell you a story. I think the best stories are told with maps. This of course is one of Asia. Asia is a big land mass. I think the same advice that was given during the Korean War, I believe by General Omar Nelson Bradley, that a major land war in Asia will be the wrong war at the wrong time, at the wrong place, whenever it is, wherever it is fought. That logic still holds true, as we found out so convincingly in Vietnam. In Asia, there's another part of Asia called Australasia, which includes Australia. Australia is still very important in the American lexicon or the American overall understanding and context of what national security means. When it comes to national security, you can't think in terms of just land masses. When it comes to the Pacific region, the Pacific being the larger ocean, you have to th think in terms of the water, obviously, being, uh, being significant, but sea lanes, travel lanes. That's why the Japanese empire, when it was established, actually was more expansive than the one that the Nazis had in Europe. Europe, land is, it has a finite, a finite a sort of quality to it. But for the Japanese to do what they did, by hitting Hawaii, then expanding, having an empire over the thousands of square miles in the Pacific Ocean, that was amazing for all the wrong reasons for an island nation with a limited population that had no real natural resources to do that. Now, clearly, if you look at the, the Northern Marianas, Guam, Palau, the Marshall Islands, Kiribati, French Polynesia, Hawaii there to the Northeast, all those areas were essential. They were pretty much, if you want to think about it like this, stones that America was stepping on as he marched in the island hopping campaign from the mid 1940s, from the mid 1940s, like 1942 to 1945, going back to the Japanese mainland. Then there's Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia, which is, of course, very important because it includes Taiwan. It includes the Philippines, which is which again the Philippines has ebbed and flowed as far as as far as significance is concerned. It has never not been important to the United States. It's just been important, more important some other times, less important other times, but never not important. Right now, it's more important than it has been in the past. The Philippines, when I spent my childhood there, the Philippines was that through point where Americans coming from the mainland, coming from the United States on the way to Vietnam, stopped there on the way to Vietnam, or people coming from Vietnam back to the world, as they called it, were stopped up in the Philippines at Clark Air Force Base, where we, where we were stationed. There was also another major base there called Subic Bay and another one called Alangapo. So Clark Air Force Base, Subic Bay for the Navy and the Marine Corps, then Alangapo also for the Marine Corps. And as far as the Philippines go, in the Philippine archipelago, the last I checked, 
there's still islands in the Philippine archipelago that have not been that have not been mapped. They're not, they don't appear on the map. This is a huge island chain. It doesn't seem so from this map, but it is a very, very large island chain. And then also look at going further west, you get to Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, the Malaysia, Indonesia, the world's largest Muslim nation or the, the nation with the world's largest Muslim population. In that, in that area around Malaysia and Indonesia are, is an area, the sea lanes called the Moluccan Straits that every now and then are plagued by pirates and piracy. China and, China and Vietnam have had a long and turbulent history. They've been to war several times. And the Vietnamese are very proud of the fact that they've beaten the Chinese every time. It turns out that the Vietnamese were very serious when they said, it's not that we don't like Americans, we don't want anybody dominating us. And then also part of Asia, we may also include Myanmar, used to be called Burma, which is now run by a military government, and India, which has, during the Cold War, was kind of lukewarm in its relationship with the West. And depending upon what's going on in India these days, although Narendra Modi, has been very friendly with the last few administrations. He's, a, he's more of an authoritarian than he is uh, somebody who's running the, world, the world's largest democracy. As far as China's footprint on the world stage, it is tremendously large. Not to mention, if you look at the Korean Peninsula, where it has, as a lever, a constant wedge for the United States. In other words, to keep us in check, as if you want to look at it from their point of view, they can apply the finger on the scale when it comes to North Korea to keep America off balance, particularly when it comes to the relationship with Japan and South Korea. You see there in the, from this map, East, East Asia, now this is East Asia, Japan, not that far away from the Korean Peninsula, which is why Kim Jong-un every now and then, who knows what goes on in that guy's mind, when he launches a missile into the ocean just to let people know, like a two-year-old, to let people know that he's still there. I can do, it would be like a two-year-old. Maybe you could dismiss it were it not for the fact that he's trying to get nuclear, nuclear capabilities. Northeast China, Mongolia. And then, like they said, the Uyghurs, which are a, a separate territory. They are Uyghur. They're Muslim population primarily. And they are being put, in, put into, well, I guess what you call them, concentration camps or re-education camps right now as we speak. Now, 2014, at the time, President Obama made the decision to reorient America's foreign policy from being so focused on Europe and the Middle East and turning it back toward Asia, which I thought was a good thing to do and long overdue. I have always been, and it might be just because I grew up in the Philippines, I spent so much time there as a child, but I've always thought that Asia needed more of America's attention because of Chinese expansion and because the Philippines is such a strategic point there to offset their influence. U.S. military officials say American dominance of the Asia-Pacific is not diminishing. But recent actions by China, including its imposition of an aircraft identification zone over the East China Sea and a near collision between Chinese and U.S. warships, show that dominance is being challenged. The Obama administration is carrying out a rebalance that would shift the focus from wars in Iraq and Afghanistan to the Pacific, where China has been building up its forces, including this new aircraft carrier, and the development of hypersonic missile technology. The commander of U.S. forces in the Pacific, Admiral Samuel Locklear, says interactions with Chinese forces in the region will only increase, and he calls for a pragmatic approach that includes boosting military-to-military -military relations with China. We have to do better at being able to communicate with each other in a, in a, in a way that allows us to not lead to miscalculation that won't be productive in the security environment. Defense analysts question whether the shift in focus has actually meant a strengthening of forces in the Pacific. Barry Pavel is with the Atlantic Council in Washington. We have the deployment of um, 2,500 or so Marines to northern Australia. That'll be there on a, a somewhat routine uh, basis. Not a very big uh, nor significant deployment in my estimation. There's a couple of ships 
Uh, I think they were literal combat ships that were discussed as being home ported in Singapore. And there really hasn't been anything else. The placing of a literal combat ship in Singapore, seen here during a tour by Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel last year, is one of the visible signs of that refocus. The United States has announced the aircraft carrier USS Ronald Reagan is replacing the George Washington at Yokosuka in Japan. A one-for-one one swap, but one the Navy says is an element of the rebalance. U.S. officials are reviewing their military commitments to allies in the region and say they could add more ships, equipment and troops in the future. With the U.S. military facing its biggest downsizing since the end of World War II, analysts say it remains to be seen how large any future military investment in the Pacific will be. Luis Ramirez, VOA News at the Pentagon. Several points of clarification or information. First off, at the very beginning of the video, those two Chinese aircraft that were taking off, those two aircraft look very much similar to Russian aircraft. For a long time, the Chinese and the Russians have been swapping information back and forth, technical details, so that looked like very much like an aircraft produced by the Sukhoi Aircraft Company. Second, literal ships. Literal ships are a new generation of war warships that are designed for close-in support of coastal areas, low draft or shallow draft, fast moving, more jet turbines as opposed to standard standard engines on the ship. So they are warships. They have a mixed record of performance and capability, and of course, high cost. And the fact that this is in 2014, if there's been a drawdown in the U.S. military, that drawdown has been reversed because of the buildup because of the changing defense situation globally. We understand that a lot can happen in 10 years, right? Yes. U.S. military officials say American dominance of the Asia Pacific is not diminished. All right. Here's a question. When it comes to China-America relations, you can do one of several things. You can continue on like nothing was going wrong or call Ian. <laughs> when it comes to American defense policy, we can either treat the, the symptoms, which is the things happening right now, or look at the disease. Now, I don't know about you all, I think most people facing a health crisis, where they get to the root of the problem, like, gee, doc, don't just treat my cancer so I can live with it. How about getting rid of it so I can just live? How about we do that? But to understand that, since we're using the cancer analogy, usually when you go to the doctor, and if you do get diagnosed with it, the first thing the doctors wanna, wanna ask for is, are you a smoker? No. Did you have it on your mother's side? Yes, no. Father's side? Yes, no. In other words, family medical history. History. In other words, what's been going on in your family one, two generations back that might give us a little bit of, so we can narrow the beam and figure out what kind of cancer this is, who it came from, how often it occurs, is it skip generation? In other words, all these things that will help us figure out some type of diagnosis to deal with the problem, the origination of the problem, not just manage it so you can be uncomfortable day to day, but to get rid of it. That's the whole point, if possible. To do that, we must visit, we must explore China, not just the relationship with the United States right now, that relationship over the long arc of time, as it says on the front of the National Archives building, that which is past is prologue. I believe a quote from William Shakespeare. That, that is, the thing that happened before, in fact, was the beginning. Now this picture, which is, which, which symbolizes or communicates the state of affairs of, of China in the 18th, but primarily in the 19th century, shows just exactly where China was at that time. You know, during the 1970s, when I was, um, when, when, when I was going to a lot of movies, you know, like The Five Fingers of Death, and Bruce Lee was real, real popular. I remember sometimes in those, in those movies coming from by Ray, Ray, Raymond Chow in Hong Kong, every now and then they would use this phrase or it, that among the Chinese actors, are, you're just a sick man of Asia. Usually that would come from Japanese 
two Chinese you know, pr protagonists. I never could understand, what do you mean sick man of Asia? What they're talking about, the, oh, the, the Asians knew, and they, of course, Raymond Chow knew, and people in Hong Kong knew where they're making the films, was that China for a long time was considered to be the sick man of Asia. Symbolically as a nation, a nation that was overrun, could not defend itself, depended upon outside support. This image symbolizes where that kind of notion comes from. China at one point in its history, not very long ago, was a nation divided internally and a nation being carved up, not figuratively, but literally by external forces, outside powers, going from the left, Great Britain, the guy with the pike, the, the, the spike helmet, Germany, pre-World War I or World War I era. The guy to his left, Austria. The person to their right, I believe that's Russia. And then to your to the far right is Japan. Everybody wanted a piece of China. Why? For the same people, for the same reason that people want a piece of China today. Big population, lots of promise as far as business investment and business opportunities. In other words, a place to make money. Or in the 19th century, a place to be exploited to be making money. The difference today is that the Chinese have gotten wise to that. And they're like, yeah, you can make money, but this time we're going to do it my way. This exploitation stuff got old real fast. The Chinese empire at one time. Again, if a map's going to tell you a story, look at the story that this map tells. Korea dominated by Japan in 1910. In 1894, there's a, there's a war with Korea. The Japanese invade in 1894, and Korea loses its loses his independence until 1945. Well, that's a long time to be, under, to be under Japanese domination, especially by Japanese people, our army that's been raised for the warriors have been raised this, according to this thing called the Code of the Bushido, the Code of the War, the Way of the Warrior. And then if you look further south, there's French Indochina, British India, British Burma, Russian Tibet, Russian influence, the latter areas. Philippines dominated by the United States, recent development back then. At one point, Manchuria is occupied by Russia. There's British, French, German, Japanese, Russian influence, Japanese influence on the, on the Korean Peninsula. So imagine in, internal divisions in China a weak government. So you can't man, you can't govern yourself internally. And you're being picked apart externally by foreign powers. That are coming there to stay, and they're not, they're coming, they're coming there, and they're, they're, they're not going anywhere anywhere. And as far as the Americans are concerned, the people from Europe, they're not just coming there, they're coming there with ideas of entrepreneurialism, colonization, and that part of that includes coming with a Bible too. We'll see what, what that produces in just a moment. 1898, Spanish-American War, the way the word, the story went, uh, boiler blew up or somebody planted a torpedo. Somehow or another, the battleship Maine exploded in Havana Harbor, and that was the pretext for America going to war with Spain, where we get Cuba and a bunch of other Pacific territories. Because of the Spanish-American War of 1898, the American advance into the Pacific Ocean where we get, we, we ended up getting Alaska, what was called Seward's Folly, Secretary of State William Seward in 1867, got there from the Russians. That's probably one land deal they wish they could take back. But look at this. The American empire in the Pacific, as you get to the 20th century, the Hawaiian Islands, 1898, Johnson Atoll, Midway, Wake Island, Guam, Howland and Baker Islands, the Samoa, and then the Philippines in 1898. A convincing, a convincing victory there, in 1890, the Spanish-American War, when Commodore Dewey blows the Spanish fleet out of the water in a literal sense. I mean, there's, it's hands down an American victory. And then Americans will spend there from 1899 to roughly 1903, 1904, fighting something called the Philippine Insurrection. Now, we got to take a moment and pause on that, because depending upon which side of the equal sign you're on, if you're the Filipinos, you're fighting a freedom fight. If you're the Americans, you're fighting an insurrection. Depends on whether or not you are coming there to colonize and suppress or throw off the latest invader. So from the Filipino point of view, they said, we, we, we're glad you guys got rid of the, we get, we're glad you got rid of the Spanish. Can you also go home? They did not. And during those interwar years from 19, from 1898 to 1900 until 19, 
41, the Americans will be there with a series of military governors, and it will be a commonwealth, a part of the United States up until the beginning of World War II, when, of course, the Japanese invade in December, January 1942. December 1941, January 1942. In China during this period, the late 19th century, as America is beginning to take its, its beginning to take its first steps onto the world stage, understand that American history had gone through several stages. In 1893, an American historian named Frederick Jackson Turner essentially said that by the late 19th century, the frontier was closed. There had always been this thing called the frontier. So it's called the Turnerian, the, the Turnerian frontier thesis. He said that back over here, when it had been Europeans all the way over here, the frontier had been the Atlantic Ocean. Then they crossed it. Some of them crossed it. And although they were still very much European, the mere fact of having crossed that thing, who they were here, who they were here on the East Coast of what became North America, that experience, they changed them. Then they crossed the Appalachian Allegheny Ridge. They had encountered Native Americans, different climatological conditions and terrains that caused them to build their homes, similar, similar to what they had back there, but different adapting to the land and the terrain. The frontier was in front of them still. The Ohio River, they crossed that. Then they crossed the Mississippi River. Then they got to the Great Plains and they got to the Rocky Mountains. Then they finally got to the, the flat areas, the deserts and whatnot, finally the West Coast. And said, by the time you get here, those people who have been Europeans over there, by the time they get here and they've encountered the Mississippi, the Ohio, the Allegheny, the Appalachians, the Rocky Mountains, everything. They fought Native Americans. They fought a civil war. They've had to be working out democracy. They've had, you know, Republican democracy. All those things that have impacted them, how they designed their homes, how they, how they care themselves. Yeah, the language that develops, all that has been shaped by the frontier. And now, in 1893, he says the frontier is closed. Well, what now? Where do you go? There's always been some new place to go out there, go further west. So by 1900, a number of American policymakers are saying, well, the next, the next logical step is, if the frontier is the Pacific Ocean in California, the next logical step is, well, beyond the Pacific. Well, not everybody was on board with that, Mark, Mark Twain being one. They didn't want America acting like an imperial nation. Well, we did anyway. Spanish-American War got us some territories, and one of those being the Philippines. But part of that expansion to the Pacific meant that America wanted to join the other powers of the world that had extended themselves in what had been European imperialism 2.0. European imperialism 1.0 had just been what we call the voyages of, Dis the voyages of discovery. 2.0 meant in the mid 19th century, but primarily the nations of Europe, they had were engaging in what was called the second industrial revolution. The second industrial revolution needed the first needed the same kind of materials that the first one did, raw materials. Now the first one had been led by England, led by their textile industry that needed cotton as a raw material. The second one needed palm oil and more industrial things for a modern economy. And the place they found it was in Asia and in Africa. Africa at the beginning of night in, in 1850 is still pretty much a continent that's ruled by indigenous kingdoms. By 1900, that's all over with, except for Ethiopia and Liberia. Ethiopia, because, well, they just weren't going to have it. They, de they defeat the Italians at a place called Ottawa in 1896, I believe. And then the Europeans leave Liberia alone because Liberia, being that nation established by former slaves or free blacks who went voluntarily went back to Africa. They leave that alone out of a nod of recognition to the Americans who finally recognized that Liberia declares their independence in 1847. The Americans recognized their independence in 1862 as some strategy that Abraham Lincoln had for the Civil War. But people wanted America to be a world power. In other words, we don't want to be left behind. We don't, we don't want to be left behind as an imperial nation. The same reason why the, the same reason today that some regimes are trying to get nuclear weapons, it gives them a sense of legitimacy, means they can't be bullied anymore. Back in this period, if you have colonies, that means you are a legitimate world power. So those, those colonies give America a sense of legitimacy, and it was a sense of just enriching itself anyway. Now, part of that meant with John Hay, he implemented something called the open door policy in China. John Hay was Secretary of State under William McKinley, or be Secretary of State, 37th Secretary of State, as indicated here, 
from 1898 to 1905. In an earlier life, John Hay had been one of, one of two personal secretaries to President Abraham Lincoln. The other guy was John Nicolay. So Nicolay and Hay, who were with Lincoln his entire administration, they were with him before he became president and with him all during his presidency up until the very last moments of his life. So John Hay had a long and story career. And at the time, they thought that his idea of an open door policy in China was brilliant. The open door, which meant this, look, we're all here in China, Russia, France, Japan, England. Everybody's here. How about we just have it like this? Have an open door, everybody can go through equally and we'll all trade equally. You don't keep me out, I don't keep you out. I defend you, you defend me. And we'll just have, we'll be here on a one-to-one -one basis and everybody will have the same rights and privileges and access like anybody else does. And of course, China, you keep your door open and you can benefit from all that trade with us. That was his idea. It was great in concept, except that it benefited everyone except the Chinese. So in 1900, there was a reaction. Not a small, not a large group of people, but a group of people calling themselves the Boxers. 1900, the Boxer Rebellion. They called themselves Boxers because they were a secret society of people who believed that they, they practiced martial arts and they wanted the, they wanted the Westerners out. One, they were tired of they were tired of corruption in their government. So domestically, get rid of the corrupt government. That's the first thing. Good governance. Imagine that. Good governance, and they want Western influence out, which meant that they wanted to get rid of their Western militaries. They were down on the West culturally, diplomatically, economically. And part of that meant that they were also down very much on Christianity. They opposed that because they're, from their viewpoint, it was Christianity that was used as the way to entry point where everything else followed, or as one African scholar told me back in the early 2000s, the missionaries came with the Bible, and we had the land. By the time we looked up, they had the land, and we had the Bible. Bear with me as I read, please. The boxers were a secret martial arts society who believed their techniques made them invulnerable to bullets. All right. That might be their first weakness. 100,000 strong, they stormed across northern China, killing foreigners, and Chinese Christians until reaching Beijing. My colleague, Dr. Gloria Singh, it might be worthwhile for you all to talk to her at some point. She's done a lot of, she, she has done a lot of research on Christianity in China. So I think she's, she's an expert in that field. They besieged the legation quarter where the foreign embassies were. In a unique show of unity, Japan, now, now look at this. This, this is written with a, with a sense of pride. In a unique show of unity, Japan, Russia, Britain, France, United States, Germany, Italy, and Austria-Hungary. Let me count that for us. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight countries invaded Beijing, lifted the siege of Beijing, and set up reparations so massive that their repercussions are still being felt today. So the boxers rebel. Just to make sure we understand the sequence. The boxers rebel, and then one of the things they, they attack is a legation quarter, that is the diplomatic section of Beijing or Peking. All right, so that they, they so the diplomats, they they pull back in, they hunker down, and when it's all over with, the Americans, everybody, the Japanese, the Russians, the British, the French, the Americans, the Germans, the Italians, the Austro-Hungarians all send troops to break the siege, and then they charge the Chinese reparations. In other words, you're gonna pay us for what you've just done in this rebellion. And the reparations are so, they are so exorbitant. They are so onerous, at least according to this, just still the, the effects are still being felt today. Now imagine that, that's 1900. 1900 to 1902, 03. Fast forward now, China does not get any more unified from that point forward. In other words, more facturing, more influence to warlords, and eventually breaks down by the time you get to World War II when the Japanese are invading, invaded by 19, by a mere 28 years later, 1903 to 1931. In Manchuria, the Japanese army stages what's called a false flag incident, the same way that the Nazis did on the, on the border of Poland to give themselves a reason to invade Poland. They dressed up Polish soldiers in German uniforms, shot them, killed them, dressed them up in German soldiers, then concocted a story that said, German border guards and killed these German soldiers. So therefore, like Adolf Hitler had been saying, he had been, during his, 
his bloodless land grabs, what they call the bloodless victories, he been saying that I'm only doing this to protect the German citizens at large, the Sudetenland, right, in Czechoslovakia. There are German citizens who are being harassed by the Czech, my, the Czech majority. And if you don't protect them, then I'm, I'm going to be forced to do something, question mark, fill in the blank. Same thing here. So the, Chi the, the Japanese blow up a railroad in Manchuria, blame it on the man, blame it on the Chinese, and that becomes their reason to invade Manchuria, which they do. They rename it Manchuko, that becomes a puppet state from 1931 until 1945 into World War II when it's taken over by the Russians. That's the beginning of the land war in the Pacific in World War II, 1931, a whole decade before we get involved. Iris Chang, if you all have not read the book, The Rape of Nanking by Iris Chang, it is a very, it's a disturbing book. Iris Chang, is a, well, she was an American, Chinese American scholar who was just completely horrified that there, there was so much attention necessarily and rightfully being given to the European Holocaust, but she asked herself a question, well, what happened to what the, what, to the, to what the Chinese or the, the Japanese did to Chinese civilians, especially during that six weeks from January through early, early June 1940, 1937? Well, <laughs> what the Japanese army did in that six weeks in, in, in Hong Kong, rather in, in Nanking, still causes one's jaw to drop. And eventually at the end of World War II, during the IMTFE, the International Military, International Military, just like in Europe, they had the Nuremberg trials, for what the Nazis did relative to the Holocaust. In the Asia, there'll be the International Military Tribunal of the Far East to deal with Japanese war criminals. And it's a good book to read. Iris Chain wrote that book. And at least one story I read that she already, she already was suffering from some emotional problems, but it was the process of researching that book and writing it that led her, led her to commit suicide not soon after. It was so horrific. During World War II, these two characters were standing side by side. The one on the left is Chiang Kai-shek. The one on the right is Mao Zedong. Now, Mao Zedong had been involved in trying to spread communism or establish his regime before the Japanese war started in China. Chiang Kai-shek was just one of a series of corrupt leaders who had been in China before World War II started. He remained corrupt. And in addition to his corruption, he was incompetent. Now, the reason why America was able to get a lot of work done with China during World War II is because of his wife, Madden Chang. She was the brains of the operation. To understand China, you have to understand that before Chiang Kai-shek, the people who were trying to get China unified were first led by Sun Yat-sen, who's leader of something called the Kuomintang. The Kuomintang became known as a nationalist. They were led by Chiang Kai-shek. And then, of course, there was Mao Zedong. Again, two people who came together during World War II to cooperate, more or less, but they had a, they had a common enemy in the Japanese. The same way that on any other given day, you might not, you would not have found, or should not have found, the world's largest capitalist nation cooperating with the world's largest colonial nation, Great Britain, cooperating with the world's largest communist nation, Russia, but they had a common enemy in the Nazis. So this is existential. And when it's existential, ideology goes on the side. In the World War II, 1949, 1949 is a busy year. First of all, in 1949, Russia will explode its first atomic device, ending America's nuclear monopoly. Had for a, a what, a three, four year period. Very short window. So they explode their first atomic device. Then Mao Zedong kicks Chiang Kai-shek and his nationalists off the mainland onto Taiwan. That's where they are, and they, so they remain today. The Cold War is on. In 1949, because of encroachments in Europe, the Europeans and the Americans will establish the North Atlantic community. They will establish something called NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, to offset growing Soviet influence. For a brief period of time, similar to what's happening today, let me be very specific, not exactly, but similar to what's happening today. You now, people, policymakers in Washington wonder, why aren't the Chinese doing more to help in the resisting Russia in their fight against Ukraine? Well, it's not in their interest. It is in their interest 
to if not be friendly with Vladimir Putin, to at least not be his enemy. So at one time, you see here, Mao Zedong and Joseph Stalin, they had something called the Soviet Sino Alliance, which scared the living daylights out of American officials in the early 1950s. Because one, the world's largest communist power, China, was now aligned with another large communist power in Europe that, had, that was nuclear capable. Again, the maps tell the stories. This is roughly from 1950. A little bit after 1950, but you get the picture. The Soviet Union, the Soviet Union at its height, the Soviet Union at, at the height of its power covered 10 time zones. Now, if you fly from Detroit to California, you're going to go what? Eastern time, Central, Mountain and Pacific. That's four time zones. This is going to take six hours in an aircraft flying at roughly what? About 600 miles an hour. Six time zones. Add four more to that, you got Russia. That's how big that nation was. And it extended into Western Europe. Joseph Stalin and the communists were, were, were determined that having been invaded by the West in World War I, that it would be America and Great Britain during the Russian Revolution, and then having been invaded by the Nazis in World War II on June 22nd, 1941, they said, the next time you guys come, not to mention Napoleon in 1812, they say you guys come, before you get to Russia proper, you're going to come through Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria. So by the time you get to us proper, we're going to make sure you're worn out, a buffer state. And then you see the lighter coloring in Africa, then down into Southeast Asia. Now stay with me. 1949, NATO is formed. The following year, on June 25th, 1950, the North Koreans invade South Korea. General Douglas MacArthur is a military governor in Japan. Japan, recently an enemy, now becomes America's best friend in Northeast Asia, which means then that Cold War politics will shift from treating Japan as a vanquished combatant now to being a Cold War ally. China is the new Cold War combatant. The Chinese, again, a country that's been around for a long time, they have not forgotten about the atrocities of World War II. They have not forgotten, and, and they have taken notice of the fact that America has suddenly gotten real sweet with Japan. They'll attack into the South, push American forces down to what's called the Pusan perimeter. You see on the left panel there, Jerome MacArthur will be ordered by General Truman, but rather President Truman, to stage a counterattack, which he'll do at Inchon which will break the, um, the, Ch the Chinese, the North Korean advance into South Korea, pushing back above the 30th parallel, back toward the Yalu River, which is a contiguous border with China and North Korea. And American activity along the Yalu River is what induces the Chinese to come in on the side of the North Koreans in December 1950. What was supposed to have been a war where Americans were looking at coming home in December will turn into a three-year slog that eventually will end up in a compromise, or should I say, a stalemate or a ceasefire. And a ceasefire means exactly what it says. It means that if you don't fire at me, I won't fire at you. Let me tell you, my first commanding officer at Camp Lejeune did about 18 months in Korea. He said that when the, he said the North Koreans are always probing. There's never a night. He said there's never a day they're not trying to find some way of getting to the South to include building tunnels. Not regular, not kind of tunnel you inch through, you know, in a, a, a human body, tunnels that where 18 wheelers can drive through. Big tunnels, where in the invasion comes underground, they're going to be coming through in convoys, in trucks. I thought he was joking until he showed me pictures of them that they had discovered. These guys are serious. To offset NATO in 1955 in Europe, the Russians, working with their Cold War, the East Bloc nations, will establish the Warsaw Pact to offset the power of NATO. Now, I mentioned NATO because in Southeast Asia, in Asia, there'll be another organization that the Americans will spearhead and establish called CETO, Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, right? So there's NATO and CETO. CETO is there to be the Asian counterbalance for Soviet and Chinese influence in the Asia area, just as NATO is there to offset Russian influence in Europe. But what nobody's looking at the whole time, then or now, is what's happening on the African continent. China is not immune, has had its eyes on this continent for a long time. 
So during this period where America is trying to make a choice as to whether or not, let me get back up for a minute. 1949, let's say 1955 to 1961, 62, 63, is a period where African nations are agitating for to get rid of the colonizers, that is to get the British and the French primarily out of their countries and, and gain independence. And it's during that period that the Americans are moving things on the chessboard, trying to figure out what can we do to offset Soviet global influence. The Russians are the, the Russians are the big 90 pound gorilla that's got to be contained, understandably. Understandably, in February 1946, an American diplomat named George Frost Kennan had, begotten, had, had gotten wind of a speech made by Joseph Stalin, it's called his Bolshoi speech, where Stalin blamed the West for all of Russia's miseries. Now, on the one hand, technically speaking, Stalin wasn't wrong. The Nazis, even though, even though Germany was ruled by the Nazis, is still a Western power, and they had caused unspeakable misery to the Russian people. So he's right in that respect, but Stalin, of course, was an ideologue. So he kind of told the truth, but bent it in a certain kind of way that would justify further, to justify because we've been hurt, we're not going to extend our influence further west. George Kennan wrote a, a letter back to his bosses back in Washington, essentially saying that the best way to deal with the Russians is to contain them. So containment became the watchword, the central through line for all of American policy against the communists that included the Russians and the Chinese throughout the entire Cold War. In other words, wherever they go, we're going to be doing right there. They go over here, we're going to be right there. We keep them right in the box, try to keep them globally contained. Wherever they, we may not invade them, but they cannot go any farther than where we are. They don't want World War III either. While America is worried about containing Russia, nations in Africa are assuming for independence. And they say, listen, America, you guys started out as a, as a colonized nation yourself. We've read your Declaration of Independence. We have heard read about your American Revolution. We too are revolutionary and want independence well, like you do. Help us get rid of the British and the French. Well, you need the British and the French in Europe to contain the Russians. So the decision was made, generally speaking, to focus on Europe and the African nations and African leaders who saw that, they said, okay, we get it. We got you. We understand. You're not going to help us get. You're not going to help us get rid of our colonizing oppressors, which means that we're going to go to somebody who will, the Russians and the Chinese. You all follow what I'm saying? So what happens now? If Asia's gone to the chi to, to China, and Europe's being dominated, a good part of Europe's being dominated by Russia. Now, the Af African nations begin inviting the Russians and Chinese in, and they begin to exert influence on that continent. This is where the problem is for us today, right now. Is you're dealing with different terrorist movements around the world, and you're, you're looking for creeping Chinese influence, you can't just look in the Pacific because the Pacific has a, has itself become sort of a global a global area of competition. So the consequences for all this stuff: China's influence in Af Africa is growing tremendously, has grown tremendously. Listen, I was in Africa and in Kenya in the early 2000s, and I was. I was told that I mean, at the time they were joking. They said that Kenya roads, let me put it like this, how, how, how do we have the conversation? One African scholar said, Kenya, except for the Mombasa road, Kenyan roads are terrible. Now, the, the, what they call the, 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 the Mombasa road from Nairobi, the capital, to Mombasa on the coast, they call it the China Road. It's built, called the China Road because it was built by Chinese money and Chinese labor. And that's the thing. The Chinese, don't, they don't come in and go like, okay, like the Americans did in Liberia when they established the Voice of America. The Liberian government said, okay, America, you can set up a radio station right here to broadcast all your stuff inside behind the Iron Curtain, but you got to hire Liberian citizens to work on the station. That was the deal. You want to broadcast your stuff? Fine. You got to hire our people there. That's our local economy. It's like a fair trade, right? The Chinese government says, yeah, we're going to build the road, but we're going to use our people in your country to do the labor. And the Kenyans go like, yeah, but what about our people? Well, yeah, what about your people? What about them? You want the road or not? Well, yeah, we do. So as far as I understand it, usually these projects, infrastructural improvement, when they come, they bring the money and countries that are on the edge of you know, economic collapse or economic difficulty, that money is a real, real tempting thing. It's hard to say no to it, especially when you need the roads to build your trade, get access to coastal and port facilities and whatnot. 
So they built it with Chinese labor and imported, which means that you have people that are coming inside of the country and people bring their culture and their ways with them. So the influence begins to gravitate out or expand out in several different ways. Here you see China reaching into Africa because of oil. And folk take note of the fact, which I say scholars of has, take note of the fact that the oil is located in West Africa, near the Bight of Benin, to the north of where that oil or the right chopstick is, is Nigeria and Cameroon. Nigeria and Cameroon share a border. And that border, there's a, there's a group of uh, so, so, so rivers there, they call the oil rivers, that flow out into the Atlantic Ocean. People don't hear about this a whole lot, but the Cameroonians and the Nigerians are also beefing back, and, they're always beefing back and forth over who owns access to those rivers because that's a major oil producing region. And until we become completely energy independent or relying upon the electrical vehicles, whenever that's gonna happen, oil is gonna be, real, like it or not, oil is gonna be reality in our lives for some time, which means the economic is gonna be a reality in our life for some time too. They're there as well. China's influence in North Korea, in, in, in Africa. I mentioned North Korea several times because I mentioned that the Chinese government often uses North Korea as a wedge or as to use leverage against the United States. But even North Korea now has influence, expanding influence in China. So if in fact, American relations in Asia to check China's growing influence are dealing with China itself, but China is also using North Korea as a lever or to gain leverage over the United States, particularly in our policy with regard to protecting Australia, Japan, and South Korea. We have to expand and enlarge our vision, understand that the leverage that they have, that country, North Korea, which is designed to keep us off balance in Northeast Asia, is also on the African continent. Do you follow where I'm going with this? Right? So you can't just look in Asia. Yes, look in Asia, but Asian influence, meaning China and North Korea, has expanded beyond Asia to this continent, which is still the world's most mineral-rich, wealthy continent on the planet that has a thing called the special kind of material that every computer, every cell phone, every screen on the iPad uses on this planet, which means that economically, you get that material, you are wealthy. And on this continent, it's being mined by warlords, meaning nobody overseeing them, no human rights, can, no human rights considerations, which means that people are working slave labor and folk are getting rich off of that. This is a statue built by the North Korean government in Namibia. Please, note, please take note of the map. North Korea is an ally of China. Or at least they share a border with China. But North Korea also shares a border with South Korea, obviously. We are an ally of South Korea. Angola, during the 1980s and 1990s, a long, bitter, brutal civil war was fought in Angola between, I mean, to the point where you had Americans there, the CIA was there, the Cubans were there, the Russians were there, and of course, they're the usual, you know, strong men in Africa talking about, you know, I'm here to fight for freedom, liberty, and democracy. Okay, whatever. But oil, oil is in Angola as well, major oil producing region. South Africa, Namibia was very, very important during the days of apartheid because it was a buffer to people working with the African National Congress coming across the border to destabilize the South African government to, of course, get rid of apartheid. Well, the North Koreans are now in, are in Namibia, and this is a North Korean official looking at a weapons display in Uganda, which means that they're also then at least have a footprint, have a presence in East Africa. The Africans call East Africa not, as we would just block off the entire eastern part of the continent, call East Africa. For them, East Africa includes Tanzania, Kenya, and Uganda. Period. But what that also means then, if they're in East Africa, if you look in the look on the, look at the map on the left. Kenya is bordering Uganda, and to the south, there's Tanzania, and to the west of Tanzania, there's Rwanda. You know the whole genocide thing in 1994, and there's still and in, in, in Rwanda, although Paul Kagame has managed to stabilize things, he's ruling now like an authoritarian. There's a lot of high hopes for him. When he came to power in the late 1990s, well, he's become another dictator. And maybe, maybe this wouldn't mean so much except for the fact that Mombasa is a natural deep water port that's very accessible and useful and necessary 
which let's say valuable to the US Navy for its access to the Indian Ocean. And also Diego Garcia, and therefore is an entryway to the Middle East. Diego Garcia is an island where we have prepositioned materials so that an American, let's say an American Marine amphibious landing force doesn't have to carry each and everything it needs. You preposition it on the island of Diego Garcia, deploy there, pick up your stuff, then move to the point of contact wherever, wherever the problem is in that part of the world. No Korean overseas laborers. They're in Poland, Libya, which has been destabilized ever since the loss of Muammar Gaddafi. There are, there are, there are rare times on Earth you can say like, where you can say to yourself historically, okay, that person being gone makes the whole planet better. Muammar Gaddafi being gone makes the whole planet better. But they're also in Chad. Chad right now is a basket case. Chad is being overrun by refugees. There's civil wars going on. Next to Chad, the Central African Republic. In the last six months, there's been coup d'etats in Niger, in Gabon, oil producing regions. And you know what? Maybe it wouldn't matter. Maybe it wouldn't matter except for the fact that in that part of West Africa where the coups have been taking place to include destabilization of Northern Nigeria, there's a, an organization called Boko Haram, which is, a, which is an ISIS wannabe, an offshoot of Al Qaeda. Do you follow what I'm saying? So we can't just look at the Pacific region. We have to look at the Pacific region and where they're exerting influence, where they're exerting influence, either propping up or sending money to these, to these, to these dictators that look the other way. These terrorist organizations are active and alive. That is a threat to our national security. And in West Africa, I think it's in Guinea-Bissau. A few, a few years ago, Guinea-Bissau was identified as being the world's first narco-terrorist state. That is. Uh, the world's first state, first nation run by the drug dealers that found out that it's actually easier to smuggle drugs from South America, a shorter distance from South America across the Atlantic Ocean to Guinea-Bissau, then run them up through West Africa into Europe, then back across the Atlantic into Canada and down into America. So it is not just enough to say Chinese, Chinese investment offers in Africa since 2010, they're on the move in that continent. Yes, there's growing influence with China in the Pacific. Yes, they are threatening the Philippines. And America, America has reoriented this direction. Look, just as back, back in 2014, 2011, 2012, the Philippines were like, you know, hey, you know, Yankee, get out. Well, they're not singing that tune anymore. Why? Because now they're facing an existential threat called China. So those bases that they kicked us out of, Study those bases are being re those bases are being reinvigorated. There's some new investment going on, and American battle fleets are seeing steaming steam back where back toward the Philippines. So it's kind of like a back to the future, a back to the past. Something's going on. It looks like part two of this drama between the Philippines and America and China going on. Again, you can see from this diagram here that Africa has also the unique distinction of being not just an African continent, but also a continent that looks in, looks out upon the Middle East, which means that Djibouti. And, and Ethiopia, Somalia, Libya, Egypt, are they're more Middle Eastern, even though physically located on the African continent, culturally, worldview-wise, religiously, meaning Islam, they're more akin and attuned to the Middle East. That must also be taken into account. So my challenge is, when talking to foreign policy people about this stuff, how do you get them to understand China's influence? Okay, Chinese influence is global, but do you, do you not understand that global also means the Philippines, it means Malaysia, Indonesia, it means India, which must be taken, to, taken into account. It means Southeast Asia, meaning Vietnam. I was at the, the, uh, the, the off-campus study fair yesterday, recruiting students to go to Vietnam in May 2024 for that May term. Vietnam has still become even more important to, Viet, to America. We just recently had another major agreement, Tuan, my number two over in Vietnam, sends me updates every now and then about new initiatives that the Vietnamese government is establishing with, with America. And the, so the relationship is getting tighter and tighter and tighter, which is good. But the Vietnamese are, have obviously proven that they know how to fight. They've proven that they're determined not to be dominated by anybody. The last time that China invaded them, they threw them back. They, the Vietnamese army 
for whatever they were back in the 1970s, they were the reason why the killing fields ended in Cambodia when that country was ruled by Pol Pot during the killing fields. Two million Cambodians lost their lives there. It wasn't over until the Vietnamese army, just having gotten rid of the Americans, invaded Cambodia and stopped that carnage. So they're a good ally in that part of the world to offset China's influence in Southeast Asia, which means the Philippines as well. Decades after scaling back its military presence in the Philippines, America is again planning to base serious military muscle in the region. America's commitment to the defense of the Philippines is ironclad. It's a really important signal that the US is serious about its security presence across the region. America's actions are a direct response to China's build-up in the South China Sea. It gives us an opportunity to position closer to the fight. Uh, and it gives us an opportunity to keep, her, keep a closer eye on the actions of the PRC uh, and the PLA in the Chinese Navy. The U.S.-Filipino deal struck this month is expected to lead to the biggest build-up of the U.S. military in three decades, and it comes with a warning. We'd note that the Mutual Defense Treaty applies to armed attacks on either of our armed forces, public vessels, or aircraft anywhere in the South China Sea or the West Philippine Sea. From its bases in Korea and Japan in North Asia to Australian base access in the South, the Philippines was the missing piece in America's strategy to contain China's growing military might. The location of the Philippines, very strategic. Uh, my successor at Indo-PACOM, uh, Admiral Davison, uh, called it uh, the most important uh, uh, geostrategic location in the Pacific because it sits astride the South China Sea or the West Philippine Sea, depending on your perspective and the size of the Philippines, uh, its proximity to Taiwan, it's very, very important strategically. Admiral Harry Harris is a former head of the US Navy in the Pacific before becoming the commander of US forces for the Indo-Pacific. He's been analyzing China's armed forces for decades. If the decision is made to defend Taiwan, should the Chinese, the PRC, uh, launch a cross-strait invasion, then uh, bases in the Philippines would be critical. Various US officials are openly predicting when China could attempt to retake Taiwan. Less than two weeks ago, a leaked memo from a US Air Force commander, Mike Minahan, revealed he told his officers to be ready to fight in just two years' time. The mere fact that the, the mere fact scholars have asked, the mere fact that they're talking about it, having discussions about it, is a cause for concern, okay? The mere, the mere fact that it's a point of discussion in the military's top brass is a point of concern. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, if you could look at a map and see where Taiwan was in the Philippines, how could you not reach a conclusion that geostrategically, that, there's reason, that the Philippines and Taiwan, the Philippines in particular, weren't going to be important at some point? How could you reach a conclusion that they weren't, weren't important then? But of course, the Philippines has internal politics just like we do too. So for a long, long time, when they were under the rule of Rodrigo Duterte, who was their strong man for a while, uh, it was very difficult. But now he's out of power as far as I understand. And, while, and keep in mind that while all that's going on, our concerns about China, the growing influence in Africa, the leverage they use with North Korea to keep us offset and off balance uh, relative to Japan and Australia and South Korea, while all that's going on, there's still the crisis going on in Ukraine. Where again, if Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping are not standing locked elbows, they're also not standing too far apart from each other. In other words, it serves the interests of Xi Jinping to also have Ukraine going on and Russia using that leverage to keep us off balance when it comes to Europe. But also, if we're, if we're too busy looking over here in Europe, then we're not watching a whole lot what's going on over there, unless we are. There's the Philippines. Now, there are some people of the mindset that I've heard saying that, you know, Ukraine is their war, we should let them do that. During the 1930s, when Europe hungered for peace, but weak democracies let gorging, democ gorging fascist nations bring war. 
It sounds too much like that to me. So what now? What do we do? China's influence is growing in the African continent. And we historically, when I first got the whole college, one of my one of my initial projects, I never did follow through on it. I got to pick that thing back up. But I was doing research over a number of years on a, to, to write a book on the history of American foreign policy on the African continent. Let me just, how can I sum it up? Dismal. The first part of our history was designed, our foreign policy was one of what? Extracting people from the continent, literally, for slavery in North America. The second part was exploiting Liberia, or as a dumping ground for people in the 19th century. We couldn't conceive of, the, of a nation that had black and white people living together in it side by side as full-blown first-class citizens. So if, we, if I paraphrase Thomas Jefferson's 1820 letter to his friend John Holmes in the wake of the Missouri crisis, I would give anything to let to set them free than deport them. That's Thomas Jefferson for you. Yes, follow me, slavery is a problem. Set them free, them, get, get, get them out of here. That's Thomas Jefferson, the most enlightened of the founding fathers. After that, standing by while Europe, and maybe America could not have done anything in the mid to late 19th century in the Europeans, flexed and took over the entire continent, except for Ethiopia and Liberia. But our foreign policy with the continent during World War I, during World War II, has been pretty atrocious. So these countries, China remembering colonial domination, African leaders in their history, they have long memories. So whatever kind of policy we're going to have with China and Africa, it's going to take that history into account. Not just sit down and just treat the symptom right now, but like I said, the disease, the whole thing. And when we, come to, when we come to the table saying, we want this from you, they're going to be a counter of saying, like, okay, let's talk about that. But first, this stuff back here, the whole long train of it that you seem to keep forgetting or don't know about. And then my African, my African colleagues introduced me to something else. I put this in here. This is a modification before I sent it to Ian this morning. I said, yes, wait a minute. I said, no, you guys will remember this. My normal, my normal customers would not. <laughs> they don't know who Peter Falk was. I said, well, you guys will remember. Peter Falk, remember that? It was one more thing. This is something that I learned in Kenya, the one, one of my first trips there. And we were talking about Daniel, Ara, Daniel Arab Moore, who at the time was the president of Kenya. You know, they were, they were complaining about corruption. And I said, yeah, you know, but I heard the same thing in Cameroon. I've heard the same thing in Liberia. I've heard the same thing in Tanzania. I said, you know, all African countries said, look, we have corruption in our government too, but, you know, we have some, some checks and balances that, well, at least for the moment, they're working. You know, things like rule, rule of law and some other things, you know, guardrails of democracy and so forth. So I, I was sitting down and I said, you know, I don't, I don't understand this. I said, I said, Robert, I don't understand. You know, I said, there, there, you talk about government, but it seems to be endemic, right? Every new leader that comes to power, they got to do the same thing. He said, Johnson, Johnson, Johnson. You don't understand. It's politics of the stomach. I went, all right. He said, African leaders, very simple. Politics of the stomach, that is, you find what the people want. If people are hungry, you feed them, right? People who are hungry, you feed them. People who are homeless, you house them. People who are not educated, you educate them. In other words, you feed their material needs. People who are hungry, they don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican on the continent. They don't care if you're a Marxist or a capitalist. If they're hungry, you feed them, guess what? You have the loyalty. Because starving men and women don't care. All they care about at that moment is that they're hungry. So if you can bring the goods, and if you know, your, your system, of, we think democracy is great. Yeah, but I can't feed the people. Which is why desperate people, when they get desperate, they may choose authoritarian government. That's why they choose the warlord. They can bribe and buy people. It sure is corrupt here, but over there, where people are starving and dying by the thousands, like they were in Somalia and Ethiopia, it works. So if Boko Haram can come and feed people, or worse yet, if Hezbollah in Lebanon can feed people and educate them and protect them. In other words, if a non-state actor, as they say in political science, can feed the things or do the things that a state either is supposed to but isn't. Guess what people are going to do? People that don't have the luxury of sitting back and looking at their 55 inch TV saying, well, they shouldn't do it that way. No, a mother who's worried about feeding her two year old and the likelihood of getting blown up in a drone strike is not going to be going through that kind of analysis. All she wants to do is stop that baby crying. If the local so called terrorist organization can do that, 
then that's what she's going to pay attention to at that moment. My admonition, my urgency, my recommendation is that we don't let the terrorist organization do that. We should be doing that. The democracy should be doing that. Yes, it's cumbersome. Yes, it's willy. Yes, it is very frustrating. It doesn't work fast enough. It never does. So therefore, we got to get better at it, in spite of all that stuff. The democracies, the, the democracies around the world, and particularly this one, I'll tell you one last story, which is kind of humorous. I was at a foreign policy conference back in the early 2000s down at the University of Texas, Austin. And this whole, this whole subject of the politics of the summit came up and corruption, blah, blah, blah. So, so it was a, it, the, the politics, the, the conference was West Africa and the United States. I went, okay, that's America, my, that's my thing. They sat around belly aching for like, two or three days, you know, corruption this, and the Americans come in their continent and do that. The Europeans come in and do this. And I said, well, okay, well, you know, well, you, when, when the French came and they, they, they got back into Benin, that's because they put down a local rebellion they, you know, somebody tried to overthrow the government, right? Yes. Then when they did, it, did that in Burkina Faso, did they not call France, you know, Paris and say, come help us? Did it, and when they did that in, uh, in Ghana, did they not do the same? They called London? So I said, well, okay, you guys don't want foreign interference, stop calling people. That's the first thing. Well, but we can't just let the, let the rebels run free. So then we were having this panel discussion one day. I kid you not, I was one of six people sitting on this panel. Five people over here. So there they went. Another day, belaking about corruption in government, blah, blah, blah. We don't know what to do. Neo -colon new colonialism, like the old kind. I said, wait a minute. Hold on. You guys have been getting independence since 1957. I said, that's like, you know, a half century. Most people can get themselves together in a half century. Right? That's, that's a pretty good amount of time. When you say one half a century, you know, 100 years, half of that, 50 years. So I said, well, what should we do? I said, well, nobody raised their hand. I said, well, I have a suggestion. I think you all should have copied the American model. What? Be like the Americans and say, yes. Will you have problems? Yes, we do. But we also have nuclear weapons. And we have a government that has a transfer of power every four years. Every now and then it doesn't work as well as, well as we want it to. I said, but it's going on well over 200 years old. It's still one of the world's oldest and thriving democracies. You should try and do what we do, emulate us. The other five people picked their chair, literally picked the chairs up, moved down to this end. <laughs> there I was all by my lonesome at this end of the table. By the time that conference ended, I looked like a porcupine. All the arrows shot into me and I said, look, sorry, you asked for a solution. We are, in, we are as our constitution said, we the people in order to form a more perfect union, not perfect, more perfect. That is every day getting better at it by inches, micro inches, sometimes by feet, sometimes by yards, sometimes by bare millimeters. But every day we're getting better at it. That's what we're trying to do, right? So perfection, we understand perfection will, perfection will not be achieved until Christ literally lands back on earth. But until then, it's a process of more perfection. We are obligated to try every day. As long as that two-year-old is out there crying and that mother can't feed, that kid has to rely upon a terrorist instead, replace the terrorist with us. That's just me talking. What do you think? Questions from the chat? Yes. Go ahead. I think it's on. Yeah. Fred. Yes. Closer to home is Haiti. Yes. And what's the take on Kenya sending troops to Haiti? Help. I find it very curious that the Kenyans are sending troops. I think it's a I think I think it's a good gesture for Kenya. The only thing I, the only thing I worry about Kenya sending troops is that you know the Kenyans, and since we have the map up here. You notice that to the north of Kenya, there's Ethiopia and Somalia. And Somalia, Somalia has been an international basket case. Look, Somalia had, at the end of the Cold War, and then into the, into the 2000s, even during the Arab Spring. Now, the Arab Spring was a thing that happened in 2011, when you have that, okay, so you, if you move west across the map of Africa to Tunisia, a right, small country in northeast and northwest Africa, right next to, next to the eastern part of uh, Algeria. It was in 2011 that a guy, just you know, just a regular individual, got tired of all the got tired of their their strong man leader, set himself on fire, very much like the monk did in uh, Vietnam that drew attention to that conflict in the 1960s. So that that act of spontaneity, spontaneous self-immolation, just caused a 
corresponding brush fire of independence movements across the entire North Africa from Algeria to Libya to Egypt. Now it failed in Egypt. They finally did get rid of they finally did get rid of Hosni Mubarak. Okay. And then down into Ethiopia. Now Sudan has got some special things going on right now that are keeping it hobbled. But relative to, to Kenya, so that 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 Air Spring moved across like that. But when it got to Somalia, Somalia was pretty much unaffected by that because Somalia had been a failed state for a long, long time. They still they are still dealing with Al Shabaab, their Al Qaeda affiliate, if you want to put it like that. So the Kenyans have had to deal with uh, Al Shabaab in a very unstable border along the northern border with Ethiopia and particularly the one with Somalia for a long, long time. So I don't know how they're doing it. I'm I'm glad they're doing it. I don't know how they're I don't know how they're finding the the depth to do it. But I think it clearly something has to happen in Haiti. I was you know what I was kind of hoping that America would take the lead on that. But we have a horrible, horrible history of intervention in Haiti, in Cuba, in Guatemala, I mean, all of Central America. So I understand why the administration was very reluctant to do that. So I think as long as somebody else is doing it, I just wish it, I really wish it had been somebody from our hemisphere. But I'm pretty sure the people in Haiti don't care. They just want the relief. So I'm just going to, I'm watching to see what happens. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, we've focus mostly on military threat that China poses to us this morning. Do you say anything about the cyber threat um, to our national security um, in terms of our infrastructure and also the uh, threat to intellectual property that the number of Chinese students in our universities pose? Well, the one thing that when it, when it comes to intellectual property, Steve, the thing that comes to my threat first and fastest is the reallocating or production facilities globally from Taiwan more back to the mainland United States, right? The chips and the, the chips and the conductors are microconductors that we use in computers and so forth, cell phones and so on. You know, I, I've always been baffled by why, why would you take a, such a significant part of your military relying upon electronics and base it just a few miles off the Chinese mainland? Or the Chinese have been threatening to attack Taiwan forever. So why do you have your, why you, so they produce some of the most advanced just and conductors in the north, I get it, all right? They, they're very good at it. We should get good at it and do it here. Now, as far as cyber threat goes, who was it? Um, recently, somebody who was a, they discovered was a, an agent working, working for the Chinese and selling oil to the Iranians, all right? This is this gets very convoluted, right? But there's, there's that. So this guy was, was part of this whole thing. You know, we're going after Hunter Biden, He's working for the Chinese. He's, he's as a Chinese agent who's selling oil to the Iranians. So there's that to deal with. But also the, the cyber threat, I don't know if the cyber threat is as well developed and matured as the Russians are, but they definitely have been explored. Like, just like in you know, a, a Vietnam firebase, they've been probing around the edges, constantly looking for the entry point. So we can't afford to not be vigilant. So I gotta look, I gotta look more into that. But you mentioned something about Chinese students here. That's why they get vetted so thoroughly, I think, right? And for a time, as a matter of Chinese-American relations, because of the pandemic, Chinese immigration, the student population went down, it's back on the upswing, which is a good thing. But it would be naive to think that all the students are students. <laughs> now, to what degree, to what percentage they are, I don't know. But I know that our State Department, I know the people in our intel services are looking just at what you said. And the thing about that, if you and I can sit here doing this in a classroom like that, Surely they must know the same thing, they suspect the same thing, they're looking into it. Only other thing is to what extent they're monitoring American electronic traffic, particularly, that's what I want to tell you all, C3I, Command Control Communication Intelligence, right? As a communications officer in the Marine Corps, we were taught that the, the battlefield was, was not two-dimensional anymore, but three-dimensional. Of course, linear, you and me, but then just uh, in, this, in the sky, but then the electronic spectrum as well. So four dimensions. The battlefield, air, but also electronic, electromagnetic traffic, which means computers, radios, satellite, telephones, everything. So you gotta be thinking about that as well. So Facebook, Twitter, they're probing everything. And it doesn't help that Americans are so, Americans are so free with their information, putting everything just out there, right? This goes back to, I mean, I'm, I'm baffled by this to the point where years ago when first Facebook first came out, my youngest son was posting pictures of his french fries on Facebook. I said, 
Who do you know cares about your McDonald's French fries? What kind of friends do you have? He said, well, Dan, I just wanted to show. I said, you know, okay. That's when I, Steve, that's when I started thinking like, okay, obviously I'm getting old. But I don't understand this. You know, why people are looking at your French fries from McDonald's you can get from any, any McDonald's in the country, right? You thought it was a big deal. But that, anyway, that's, uh, I, I, I'm thinking that, I, again, I think it would be naive to think that, because I've heard that the North Koreans, even the North Koreans are looking at cyber cybersecurity threats. And we know that the Russians have a very well-developed cybersecurity organization as part of the Russian army right now. And it's 1980s, 1990s doctrine, but the Russians had entire communications battalions dedicated to doing nothing but communications interference. Whereas we have an artillery battalion, they have nothing but calm people that do nothing but that, monitoring traffic and interfering with it. So they're very built up. And I, I just saw um, the guy who used to be in charge of the cybersecurity um, apparatus during the Trump administration. He was on TV this morning talking about everything we're doing right now, the fact that he's he's gone on to work for another company. But he's, I, can't, I wish I could remember his name right now, but he's he's on top of it. He's giving, giving the same warning that you're talking about, that in, 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 in the run up to the 24, 2024 election, he said the traffic is going to be insane. And they're already they're already seeing it right now. Yes. One okay. more question right up here. Yes, sir. Uh, I was going to, uh, to your point, if you look at their, I think it's the, what they call Chinese, the J5, their latest stealth fighter. It's almost a Xerox copy of the F-22 because they cracked Northrop Grumman's software. They found out. Fortunately, oh, yeah. they didn't get the materials, but yeah, they got that. Um, something that you didn't mention, but it was kind of interesting that's developed in the background uh, with Australia, the U.S., Britain, um, in their common conflict with China, I'll just call it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they are going to be getting four Virginia-class submarines in Australia. Mm -hmm. So there's more moves afoot than than what we necessarily know. There, the, the bad news is with that, we've only got three shipyards left out of five we had for the military use, and only two of them build subs. So the backlog is formidable. Well, well, and you know what? To show you how to show you how acute of a threat this is becoming, there some of you are probably aware of the fact that there's a news report just the other day. The Taiwanese have built their first homegrown submarine, nuclear submarine. So the Taiwanese have built one. So Taiwan says, you know what? We we need one. We can't buy it from the Americans, so we built they're building their own. That's how that's how much they perceive the threat to be, in addition to what you're talking about. So yeah. Austral, uh, we need to, people need to, we need to use Australasia a lot more in front of our lexicon to include Australia. You know, we tend to think Australia is hanging out there. It is, and that's the problem. So Australia, New Zealand, and all the islands, and that, that those island groups are going all the way back to Hawaii, they are, they are part of the overall strategic pattern that we need to pay attention to as China continues to expand in that area. And as far as the Philippines, I mentioned the Philippines several times, the Filipinos, and did you, did you notice how General Lloyd Austin said South China Sea or the Western, West China, the West China Sea? The Filipinos call it West China Sea. That's what their name, they, they get, I was told by a Filipino student at Hope College that they get very annoyed and we call it South China Sea. It's Western Philippine Sea. I said, okay, we'll do it your way. <laughs> okay, but you know, so, so they're, they're building, literally building islands in the Pacific Ocean that they then claim as their own, the Chinese do, which and so they get closer. So if I, if I build an island right here, it's closer to Taiwan, I claim it's mine. Well, I, I built it, it is mine, but the problem is now I'm, not, I'm that much closer to Taiwan. So they're doing that also relative to the Philippines and Taiwan. So I don't know what the response is going to be, but it needs to be something. We gotta do something. And an aircraft, an aircraft carrier battle group is always a very convincing display of power. So they've been deployed. Who else? Yes, ma'am. This is gonna to have to be our final question. For a very long time, <clears throat> missionaries in China have been funneling students that they handpicked to Hope College. Hope has a Chinese contingent in their student body for a long time. Mm -hmm. Today, there are about 20 or 25 Chinese speaking students in the student fellowship group. They turn up in your history classes, don't they? 
So you may have some impressions from Chinese students who are studying at Hope College right now. I don't recall very or many. Or not necessarily, or that maybe they don't turn up in your classes. Well, so I, haven't seen, I, have, I haven't had very many in my classes. Okay. But we do have a contingent on the on the campus, that's true. Yes, who kind of and communicate I, I, with each other and they bring their families come over frequently. They speak very little English, but. Uh, well, I have seen Dr. Singh, she, she's fluent in, I don't know if it's Man, Mandarin or Cantonese, but either she's fluent in China in Chinese. So I see her every now and then talking with Chinese students in the hall. So they're there. I just not had the I just not had them had had not had them in my class. <laughs> she teaches a class on um, France and China during World War II. So I think some of them have taken her classes. But all across the country, in in small colleges and large, there are contingents of Chinese students flowing over here in a regular regular stream. Mm -hmm. So there is an impact of American higher education on Chinese. Well, yeah, Ameri students. American American higher education for the for the moment. It's still the gold standard as far as the world's educational systems go, because you know a lot of edu a lot, when it comes to higher ed for many countries around the world is very rigid and very stratified, you know. But especially the liberal arts tradition, where you can go in many different directions, yeah, they, they yeah, I can see where that that would attract people. But I just have to I'll talk to Dr. Singh and find out just exactly what she thinks with the 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 number of people are and how many she's been in contact with. That's a very good observation, though. You all have been wonderful. Thank you for staying awake and asking and not asking will it be on the test. Thank you. Thank you for being here, everyone.